Today I'm going to take you to one of the Psalms which tells us that the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Well, we can identify with God's loving compassion, but why does his compassion fall on those who fear him? What does it mean to fear the Lord? A charge that we find in both the Old and New Testaments. We will see there is a difference between being afraid and the commandment to fear the Lord. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Now, these are parallel lines. I should have put father in parallel with Lord, which I, I didn't do that. But clearly, compassion is repeated. So we, that's parallel. Compassion is repeated. Now, look at children and fear him. So the children are to fear the father. We, who belong to God, are to fear God. That's what this verse is telling us. So I'm going to take you to Hebrew, and you may not know the Hebrew, so I'll just work with it a little bit. I like to read the Hebrew first, so ke rachem av al banim. Well, ke, it simply means like or as. It's short for ka'asher. So like or as, the father. Okay, but let's take the verb next. The verb is raham. When it's used as a uh, noun, it's always in the plural of rachamim, which is the one up at the top. But look at this. It's also used to be the womb of a mother in which a baby grows to be born. So Hebrew has these visual images. It's pronounced differently. It's rachem. Rachem means a womb. Rachamim, plural, means the compassion. So it, it, I just point this out to you. I think it's, it's a wonderful word, rachamim, compassion, like the, a mother having the, this incredible loving and compassion of the child that's growing in her room. Av means father, and I point out that Abraham's name, Avraham, is the father of a multitude. So Av means father. Al is honor upon. Now we get banim, and ben is singular for son. Banim is the plural. That's something you just memorize when you're learning Hebrew. It's ben banim. That's what you memorize. It's the singular, the plural, ben banim. Now, I'm going to show you one more thing about this word for ben banim, and that's when you put it into a word pair. In English, we say the sons of Israel, but in Hebrew, you say sons Israel. But to show that it's sons of Israel, it's in a word pair, and the im sound of the plural changes to a, like b'nai Yisrael. So b'nai is banim, but the sound changes because it's a word pair, b'nai Yisrael. So I'm just showing you that. Now what we're going to do is I'm going to read the first line in Hebrew and see if you get a meaning from the first line. Ve'rachem av al banim. So as the father has this compassion on the sons, now we get richam Adonai al av. I've put in red the same word for compassion. Adonai is, in English, they say Jehovah or Yahweh. But Jews will say Adonai, which means Lord, or Hashem, which means the name. I learned my, my Hebrew. First, I started in the university, and it was all grammar. And so I thought, this is crazy. So I went to Israel, and I studied for two months, two months in an ulpan, where um, it was in the late 90s, and the Russian Jews were coming in because the Soviet Union had collapsed, and the Russian Jews were coming in, and they had to be crashed into Hebrew. And I was one of those students <laughs> to be crashed into Hebrew. So I was taught by Jews in Israel. And then when I returned home, I continued to be uh, instructed by one of our, our members of our, our synagogue in, in, uh, in my hometown. So I was taught to say Adonai. So whenever you see Yud Hey Vav Hey, I will say Adonai. So we have here Reham Adonai. Al Yereav. On Yereav. Well, let me show you one thing first. Okay, that Vav at the end is a direct object, meaning him, okay? Meaning him. The verb is Yara, which means to fear. Yara. 
so who fear him. It won't yara is the verb, but it's in an adjectival form. But anyway, don't don't worry about the grammar. So we have Riham Aronai Al Yureav on those who fear him. Um, I'm going to take you now to Isaiah. And before I get into what Isaiah says about compassion, I'm going to have to go to the introduction to that verse about compassion. So let's go to the introduction first. So this is in Isaiah 30, 18, and it's the introduction to his talking about rachamim, which is that plural word for compassion. For thus the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said, In repentance and rest you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength, but you were not willing. Now that's the introduction. We have parallel lines. It's very easy to see rest and quietness. That's very easy, rest, quietness, because they're, they're synonyms. Now, we have repentance and trust. Those are not synonyms. It's what I call cause and effect. Repent is to turn away from some kind of sinful action. And if you do that, you are trusting in the Lord. And you get the same cause and effect in the green. Those who are saved have great strength to walk in the ways of God. Now, just for fun, I'm going to show you a couple things here. Saved is the Hebrew yasha from which we get Yeshua. Yeshua's name means salvation. And another word that I find interesting is strength, which is gavara, and that strength leads to righteous deeds. There are two aspects of salvation. When you first believe in Yeshua, you have the promise of future salvation with God, which we call eternal life. But then it's like God pats you on the back and says, okay, I'm going to teach you now how to walk in righteousness so you can draw near to me. And that's the second aspect of salvation, which is your daily walk and learning how to walk in righteousness as you draw closer and closer to God. The Lord longs to be gracious to you. And therefore, he waits on high to have compassion. It's very important to take a look at the parallel lines. God is going to bestow grace and to give you compassion. All right? So uh, those are kind of synonymous. It's God's grace will, will bestow compassion on you. To whom does he bestow compassion? Those who long for him and wait for him. Those are synonyms. So if you're living a life that is longing for God, wanting to draw close to him, you're waiting for the return of Yeshua, but you want to draw closer and closer to God through your walk with Yeshua, then God's grace will fall on you and he will have compassion on you. That's what those parallel lines are saying. Now we finish it and it says, for the Lord is a God of justice. All right, this is talking about judgment. Now we are being judgment in a, on a daily basis, but there will be a future judgment that will determine who, now from my, all my research, who will participate in the remnant. We all have the promise of eternal life at some time, but we're all not going to get it all at once at the same time. And it's going to occur first for the remnant because there's a role for the remnant to play to bring the rest of God's children into his righteous presence. So for the, the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are all those who long for him. So at the time of the, the future judgment, those who long for him, they wait for him. He's going to bestow his grace on them. He's going to have compassion on them. And he's going to to judge them righteous in his eyes and in, in my work worthy to participate in the remnant, which will carry on the work of God to bring all of his children into his presence. And we have here Yeshua talking to his disciples. Now there's a very large crowd of people who have come to hear him speak, but he is specifically talking to his disciples as those who have been chosen by God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion. Now, there's a whole list. The heart is, has kindness. You know, Yeshua touched the leper who was shunned, all right? So that's compassion. You have compassion on all people, not just Christians, on all people and all people who need that compassion. Do you have a heart of kindness? Do you have a heart of humility, a heart of gentleness, and a heart of patience? The New Testament says to put on a heart of compassion. That's what we just read, put on a heart of compassion. To put on a heart of compassion, you have to be walking as Jesus Christ walked. 
How well do you know him? How, to what extent are you committed to walking like he walked? Now I'm going to show you here. Yeshua refused to condemn an adulteress. Adultery is a sin. It's a grievous sin. But Yeshua had compassion on the adulteress and, and gave her words of compassion to the point where she repented of her sin. But he had compassion on her. He touched the leper. Leprosy is so contagious that if you touch a leper, you're going to get leprosy. And, and leprosy eats away at your flesh. Your nose falls away, your cheeks, your, you know, it, it eats your flesh. It's a terrible disease. They didn't even find a cure for it until the late 1800s. And, and people didn't want to touch a leper, so they made the lepers live in their own area where no one, you know, they may leave food outside where the leper can come and get food, but they wouldn't touch a leper. Jesus touched a leper. That's the compassion he had on the leper. Are you in Christ walking as he walked? Jesus received a woman who was virtually unpoor. Her, her, her monthly bleeding had never stopped. The women would stand on the outside of the crowd, and the men would be pressing in to hear Yeshua, and the disciples would be closest to Yeshua. The women would be on the outside. She crawled at the feet of the men to come to touch his robe. She was unclean. Rich, she was richly unpoor because of, of her bleeding. If the men had known what she was doing, they would probably have stoned her to death. And yet Jesus received a woman who was ritually unpoor, who touched him. We also see him healing a man who was thought to be a sinner. Now, the, you know, the, the Jews of the time would have turned away from the sinner. But Jesus talked to sinners. He accepted sinners. He witnessed to sinners. He, he had compassion on sinners. So we go back now to Psalm 103. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. I want to go now into the whole concept of fearing. What does it mean to fear the Lord? Let me take you to the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you but to fear the Lord your God? Walk in all his ways. So somehow walking in all his ways has something to do with fearing the Lord. Love him has something to do with fearing the Lord. Serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul has something to do with, <laughs> with fearing the Lord. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Now there's a reason for it. The people in ancient Israel were fearing the Lord because of the future coming judgment. Now, for Christians, we say, oh, you've been saved. You don't have to worry about it. That is the wrong attitude. And yes, you have the future, the promise of future eternal life with God. But who is God going to choose to participate in the remnant? Now look at Paul. Paul is, is talking to people. He's witnessing to people. And Paul is talking in his letter to the Corinthians. Having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. This is talking about the future judgment. Just because you have the promise of eternal life doesn't mean that you're going to be judged worthy to come into God's presence. To become worthy, you have to cleanse yourself. Now, you can't be perfecting holiness. That doesn't mean you can be perfect. God only sees the heart. And, and he will declare who is worthy to come into his presence by looking into the heart. And does your heart truly believe to cleanse yourself of sins by repenting of... We all, we're all sinners. But are we growing closer and closer to God by addressing one sin after the next sin? You can only do one at a time, you know, I think. That's the way I look at it. Now I want to go on to the distinction between being afraid and fearing God. What's happening here is all the people perceived the thunder and lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. This was the exodus had, had occurred from Egypt and they're now by Mount Sinai. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we will die. Now then it continues. Moses says, 
Do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you, and in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. The fear is the fear of the coming judgment. And if you fear the coming judgment, you're going to do your best to overcome sins in your life and to grow closer and closer to God because maybe he will find you worthy to participate in the remnant. You're going to come into his presence at some time, but you may not be selected at the time of, of the remnant. Okay, let me give you another example here. The one among the servants of Pharaoh, this is back in Egypt before the Exodus, who feared the word of the Lord. Now, these are Egyptians. The one among the servants of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord made his servants and his livestock flee into the houses. But he who paid no regard to the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. And then I want to show you here about the, the, this where they are in Egypt, only in the land of Goshen, where the sons of Israel, there was no hail. It was really very interesting because the land of Goshen is up where the Nile empties into the Mediterranean. It's a very, very lush part. It's also lush along the banks of the Nile River, but as it goes into the Mediterranean, it fans out. And that's um, where the, the people of Israel were there. No hail fell on the land of Goshen where the people of Israel were. Now, what is the fear of the Lord. And I'm showing judgment here. Because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, this is Paul and Romans, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So just because you have the promise of future salvation with God does not mean that you're, you're not going to be judged and, and the judgment may be bad. <laughs> Who will render to each person according to his deeds. Now, that's not whether you're going to be saved or not saved. That's going to, to determine whether you are ready to come into God's righteous presence. And that's Paul citing from the psalm. Why should we fear the Lord? Let me keep going here. This is Isaiah 4, 43, 1. Thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, I have redeemed you, I have called you by name. The ones who are called are called by the name of God. They belong to God. That is, every single believer in Christ is called by the name of God. And I have come to the conclusion that every Jew is called by the name of God. They all belong to God. They're called by the name of God. But who are the chosen? The chosen bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. I chose you. You're the chosen ones. I appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. So you're bearing much fruit, and those are the chosen ones. But the question here is, who is fearing the Lord? It's those who are dedicated to walking in the ways of God and the ones who are bearing fruit. Now, this parable, by the way, is, is in Matthew, and it continues. When the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes, and he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. So who is fearing the Lord? Well, metaphorically, it's the ones who are wearing proper clothes at the wedding banquet, which is coming after the final judgment, all right? So this is the, the future wedding banquet at the time of the final judgment. Let's look at the metaphor of being clothed. The Lord made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them to cover their sins. Now we go into the New Testament, put on the new self. That's to put it on. It's, it's metaphorically clothing yourself with a new self, right? Which is in the image of Yeshua, our Lord, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. And again, we get the king saw a man there. This is in the parable who was not dressed in wedding clothes. He had not repented of his sins and he was not being chosen. He was called by that he belonged to God's family, but he was not dressed in wedding clothes. He was not, and at the time of judgment, he is not worthy to participate in the remnant. And so the king said to his servants, bind this man hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. The outer darkness is not hell. It's not eternal death. It's separation from God. Only those who are worthy in God's eyes, who have been committed to growing closer and closer to God by 
repenting, overcoming sins, and their daily walk is more and more glorifying God by their walk of righteousness. So outer darkness is separation from God. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I think those are all the, certainly the Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, who consider themselves righteous, but maybe they're going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth because they're not going to be chosen. So who is fearing the Lord? Those who are not going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth at the time of the judgment. All we can do is in our hearts wanting to draw closer and closer to God, and God will make the, the, the final decision. 